Rather than make it through the storm. Rather than make it this far. The valley and over the hills. I know it had to be gone. How did I make it through the storm? How did I make it through the rain? You wanna know just how I made it? It's so easy to explain. It was God's grace. It was God's grace. It was God's grace. It was God's grace. Oh, I made it this far. Yes, I did. By the grace. This morning's scripture is going to come from Revelation, and uh, it's going to be chapter 22, and we're going to go from verses 10 to 14. May everybody stand, please. Revelation chapter 22. We're going to read 10 through 14, and it reads in its entirety. And he said unto me, Seal not the sand of this prophet of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still, and he which is filthy, let him be filthy still, and he that is righteousness, let him be righteousness still. And he said that, and he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give it to every man according to his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandment, that they may have right to the tree of life, and they may enter through the gates into the city. May the Lord have a blessing on the hearers and do of his holy word. Let us pray, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we come again. Father, just to let you know, Father, how blessed we are. And Father, we, we cannot take these things for granted. Because, Father, we just look. And we don't have to look further, Father. To see that, Father, there were some people that woke up, up this morning, Father, that was not close in their right mind. And, Father, you bless us this morning, Father, to be close in our right mind. And, Father, as we look a little further, Father, we can see, Father, that you supply all our needs. You give us food on our table, Father. You give us clothes on our back. And, Father, we don't have to look too far because, Father, there's so many people that don't have food on their table and clothes on their back, Father. And Father, we can remember not too long ago, Father, when we didn't have but that one old suit to put on. You know, Father, now we got clothes in our closet that we had to sit there and wonder what we're going to put on. Father, oh, how good you are. And sometimes, Father, we take these things for granted. But, Father, we just think we serve a Father like you, who, Father, that look beyond our faults and see our needs. And, Father, we just want to thank you. Now, Father, we ask you to look on our sick and shut in. Again, Father, let them know, Father, that you are still God and that you are still in control. And, again, don't matter what them old doctors say, Father, you're going to have the last word. Now, Father, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit to dwell with us here today at Ebenezer Baptist Church. Bless us, Father, individual and collective. And, Father, we always ask a special bless blessing on our pastor, his wife, and his family. Father, keep him strong.
Keep him doing what he need to do, Father, to keep all ever needs it, Father. Let the world know that, Father, you are still God and you are still in control. And, Father, we ask a special blessing on our kids. And, as Father, I know this year, in the last 18 months, Father, they've been doing their best. And sometimes, you know, things might seem hard to them, but, Father, let them know, too, Father, that you are still God. And we ask a special blessing on the parents that, and the mother and the father that stand behind these children, Father, to keep them going in the right direction. Because there's so much in this world, Father, that they can dwell them in the wrong direction. So we ask you to continue to let the parents lead them and guide them out. So a special blessing on them. And, Father, most of all, always in my prayer, Father, I say, we just want to thank you for your son or you sent on this earth to show us back to you, Father. These things we ask in your name and in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 We, on behalf of Dr. Rudolph Overstreet this morning, I first let me say uh, good morning and thank all of you for coming and being with us today. <clears throat> there are plenty of other places you could have gone, but God placed, or you just simply could have stayed home, but God placed it on your heart to be here today, and I'm mighty thankful that you were obedient to what the Lord had to say to you in that regard. In regard to announcements, um, we have two. I will make one, and Brother Paul Clausdale will make the other. The first one is uh, Sister Sarah Pritchard will be celebrating her 100th birthday. And so Saturday the 24th at 1 o'clock, there will be a uh, drive-by celebration for Sister Pritchard. She lives right across the street. Pastor informed me this morning that they will gather here, That's or we one. will gather here at the church at 12. And then there will be a motorcade that will go uh, by Sister Pritchard, and you can wave at her and say hello to her and happy birthday. And you can give her a gift at the same time if you so desire. So 100 years is a long time. And and it's a blessing that we have a uh, member who has, a, has achieved that goal. And so we want to help her celebrate next week. Now, um, also today is our pastor's anniversary. And Paul is going to do it from there. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Paul Claus, our pastor resource committee president. And I just wanted to make you aware that Today is Pastor Overstreet's 35th year anniversary. And we are going to have a drive through this afternoon at 2 o'clock. For those of you who are willing to come back and, and uh, greet the pastor and let him know how much you love him, <coughs> he and his wife will be sitting out on the front for you to come by and wave at him, honk your horns, and to uh, posit any gift that you might have in the box. We'll have a box on the curb for those of you who want to donate a gift to him. But we just want you to know that we love our pastor and we want to recognize him and honor him today, being this is 35th year anniversary at Ebenezer Baptist Church. That's a long time now, and we know that. So let's give Pastor all the glory we can today. Thank you. Amen again. You know, uh, 35 years is a long time. And uh, I was talking to Dr. Overstreet earlier in the week. And, you know, there, there's a lot of pastors who have pastored for 35 years. And there are a few of them who have pastored at um, one church for those 35 years. And, you know, cumulative. A lot of them have pastored 35 years at cumulative churches, and then there's a few that have pastored at one place for 35 years. But there's a limited few who have pastored at the very church they started for 35 years. 
that is a testament of commitment on both sides. And so uh, this is a unique celebration as far as I'm concerned uh, that Pastor Overstreet have pastored here for 35 years. And uh, so I'm grateful, Pastor Overstreet, for your service, and I'm also grateful that uh, he has allowed me to, to say something uh, this morning on that blessed occasion. Uh, Reverend Williams, I was thinking about when I was a little boy or younger man, um, I wasn't old enough to drive, but I was driving. And my father and I would go all over Scammy County, Conecuh County to different churches. And every now and then on the way home, he'd give me the keys and let me drive. And I, and I was so happy. So Pastor Street, I appreciate you giving me the keys this morning <laughs> and let me drive. Now, um, at this point, we normally do our sermonic hymn, and so uh, this morning I am going to, for the sake of time, we're going to do the sermonic hymn, and I'm, I'm going to sing a song for our hymn. It's an old song. Back at my home church, there was a deacon. His name was Deacon Bill Davis, Willie Davis, Bill Davis. This was his favorite hymn, and I grew up on that hymn, and it, it become a favorite of mine as well. The song says, Jesus, keep me near the cross. Amen? Precious, precious fountain. You know what? It's free, free to all. We give all honor and praise today to our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, because he is worthy to be praised. We just thank him for allowing us to be among the land of the living, because we could have been dead sleeping in our graves, amen? But because of his grace and his mercy, he has allowed us to run on a little while longer. And we thank him for that. 
Again, I thank Dr. Overstreet for allowing me an opportunity to uh, speak today on such a, uh, such a blessed occasion. I say again, 35 years is a, is a long time to uh, pastor in one place, same church, same group of people. A lot of things have changed uh, over those 35 years. And so, Pastor, I thank you for the opportunity for allowing me to be here today. Now, I don't have anything new. Breaking news, I don't have anything new. Because this gospel has been preached for over 2,000 years. But the good news is that it does remain as fresh and as effective and as rewarding as when it was originally preached over 2,000 years ago. Now that being said, there is a word from the Lord today. <clears throat> and as always, I pray that you will pray with me and pray for me as I share with you what God has given me to give to you, his, his people. So if you have your Bible or your electronic devices, I would love for you to turn to the Old Testament, to the book of Amos, chapter 7. The Old Testament to the book of Amos, chapter 7. And we will look at verses 17, 7 through 17. But our point of entry will be verse 7. And because of the pandemic conditions, I will read for your hearing only three verses, verse 7, 8, and 9. But I would still love for you to stand if you're able as I read God's word. And those who are unable to stand, just please remain in your seat. Now, I will be reading from the New International Version of the Bible. And so, depending upon which version you have, you will find these words are similar words. Amos chapter 7 from the NIV, and it reads, This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing by a wall that had been built true to plumb with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord asked me, what do you see, Amos? A plumb line, I replied. Then the Lord said, look, I am setting a plumb line among my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. The high places of Isaac will be destroyed, and the sanctuaries of Israel will be ruined. With my sword, I will rise up against the house of Jeroboam. Please remain standing. Our Father and our God, Lord, once again we come to you, Lord, with bowed heads and humble hearts. Lord, we just thank you for being the awesome God that you are. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for your, the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we pray this morning that I will decrease and you will increase. And your Holy Spirit will use this vessel of clay to share your word with your people. And I pray that your people will be receptive to the word that you are sending to them. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So from these verses, I've chosen as a subject this morning, with the aid of the Holy Spirit, a fearless messenger. A fearless messenger. Amos was one of the 12 minor prophets. And, and, and the 12 minor prophets are commonly called the Book of the Twelve because there are 12 books and scholars say that they can fit into one row, so they're called the Book of the Twelve. And they are referred to as minor because their content is minor. But their context, the words, the text itself, is just as significant as any other book in the Bible. And Amos was one of these minor prophets. And he prophesied around 750 B.C., at a time when 
Jeroboam II was king of Israel, and Uzziah was the king of Judah. And sort of as a background, most of you Bible scholars know that when King Solomon died, that his son Rehoboam inherited a unified kingdom. And what that means is that all 12 tribes of Israel were united as one kingdom. But because Rehoboam took some bad advice from a young council, the kingdom tribes rebelled and the kingdom was split. And the southern kingdom consisted of the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin and Rehoboam was the king of that tribe. And Jeroboam took the northern kingdom, which consisted of the remaining ten tribes. But Jeroboam had a problem. This is Jeroboam the first. Jeroboam had a problem. The temple that Solomon built was in Jerusalem. And so the people from the northern kingdom would occasionally migrate back to the southern kingdom to worship at the temple that Solomon built. And Jeroboam didn't want that to happen because he was afraid that they would eventually gain alliance with the southern king and he would be overthrown and kill and lose his power. So to remedy that, he had two golden calves erected at both ends of the northern kingdom, one at Bethel and one at Dan. And he told the people this. He said, you ought to worship these golden calves. This is your God. This is who really led you out of Egypt. And so he instituted idol worship. And so in today's text, we fast forward 200 years later, and we find the same problem in the same city, in the same nation, but there's a new sheriff in town. But his name is also Jeroboam, and he is referred to often as Jeroboam the second or the second Jeroboam. Now, during the reign of Jeroboam, Israel was a prospering city. And, and it was a time of peace. There was no wars, there were no rumors of wars. I'm reminded of a story that Charles Dickens wrote, a book he wrote called A Tale of Two Cities. Some of you have perhaps had to read that in school. But Mr. Dickens says, as in describing the times associated with the tale of two cities, Mr. Dickens says that it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. And that best describes the times in Israel when Jeroboam II was king. It was the best of times because they had economic growth. The city was prospering, no wars, no rumors of wars. Everything was great, according to the king. But it was the worst of times, because idol worship was rampant. Immorality was rampant. Social injustice was rampant. The poor was being oppressed. And so while the king thought it was the best of times, God was not happy. He was not pleased. And so God sent his prophet Amos to preach to the inhabitants of Israel. And verse 7, this is what Amos said. Amos said in verse 7, this is what he showed me. The Lord was standing by a wall that had been built true to plumb with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord asked me, what do you see, Amos? A plumb line, I replied. Now, if any of you know anything about brick masonry or construction, then you know that when nothing else exists to give the brick mason or the carpenter a, a true indication of, of the verticality of a wall, that he or she will use a string with a weighted tool instrument on the end of the string, and the weighted tool is called a plumb or a plummet, and he will use that tool to determine 
if the wall is vertically straight and true. In other words, the plumb line is a tool that's used to determine what perfect good looks like. Not just what good looks like. Because in God's eyes, good ain't good enough. But it's what perfect good looks like. And this wall, in Amos' vision, was the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel was built by God himself. Let that soak in for a second. Everything was well-ordered. It was built to perfect specification, according to the original model. In fact, Isaiah says in 42, 6, Paul, if you have that, Isaiah 42 and 6, Isaiah says, I, the Lord, called you, Israel, in righteousness. And God said, I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you. I will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. In other words, Israel was meant to be an example for the surrounding nation. Israel was supposed to be what good looks like. And all the other nations should, were supposed to be able to point to Israel and say that's what a nation of God looks like. They were supposed to be an example for the surrounding nation. So God had built this nation. And now in today's text, it's sad when you think about it. Now, God stands upon this wall to consider what he must do with it. He stands on it with his plumb line in his hand to take measure of it, to see if it is bulging under the pressure from the world. He uses the plumb line to see if it's crooked, to see if it's lost its integrity. And he told Amos, if it's found deficient, I will destroy it. Sad state. From go Israel goes from being what an example of a nation is supposed to look like to God considering whether or not to destroy it. And today, the church represents that wall. Now, I'm not talking about Ebenezer Baptist Church or the church up the street or any church in the surrounding areas. I, when I say the church, I'm talking about the body of Christ. Blood-washed believers. We represent that wall. And this word is the plumb line. And God has taken this plumb line from Genesis to Revelation, everything in it from Genesis to Revelation. He's taken it to see if the church, the body of Christ, true washed believers, if we are bulging under the pressures of the world. He's checking to see if we have lost our integrity, if we have become crooked. He's looking to see if we have removed love and installed hate. He's checking to see if the body of Christ have become politicized. He's checking to see if we have forgotten that all men are created equal and we have replaced that with prejudice and bias and division. God is checking to see if we are bulging under the pressures of the world. So God told Lamus, he said, look, I'm setting a plumb line among my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. The high places of Isaac will be destroyed, and the sanctuaries of Israel will be ruined. With my sword, I will rise against the house of Jeroboam. Now look at what Amos, what Amaziah did. Amaziah was the priest of Bethel. So he sent a message to his boss, Jeroboam the second, the king of Israel. He sent a message, and, and he was like a little kid that, that, that runs to the teacher to tell on another kid. He, he accused Amos of conspiring against the king. 
And his message to the king, Amaziah said, Amos is raising a conspiracy against you. And he's not doing it in a corner king. He's doing it in the very heart of Israel. And this stuff that he's talking about, the land can't bear to hear what he's, what he's putting down. And, and first he said, Amos said first, I mean Amaziah said first Amos is saying that Jeroboam will die by the sword. Then he said that Israel will surely go into exile away from their native land. But apparently, Jeroboam, the second the king, he, he, he wasn't fazed by that at all. Perhaps he, he reasoned to himself, I am the king of this great nation. Times are good. People are happy. They got plenty of money. Economic growth is, is, going, is, is going on. They're prospering. There's no wars and no rumors of wars. Everything is good. I'm not worried about some shepherd from Judah who now calls himself a prophet. So he wasn't phased by it. He wasn't worried about what Amaziah told him. But I tell you who was worried, Reverend Williams. Amaziah was worried. He was worried because, unlike the king, Amaziah knew that he was appointed by the king. But he knew Amos was called by the king of above, the true and living God. And he was worried about Amos because he knew that he was a God-sent prophet and he did not want Amos in his business. Amen. You see, Amaziah was the priest that led the people into idolatry at Bethel. And he was bent on keeping his position. And he felt threatened by the prophecy of Amos. Oh, we have that in the church today. People who are bent on keeping their position. And they are undermined the man of God to keep their position and what they perceive as power. Let's look at verse 12 and 13. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Get out, you seer. Go back to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and do your prophesying there. Don't prophesy anymore at Bethel. Watch this. Because this is the king's sanctuary and the king's temple of his kingdom. Oh, I tell you, my brothers and sisters, Amaziah was a misguided priest. He, he believed that Amos had no authority in Israel because it was under the jurisdiction of Amaziah and Jeroboam II. So he tells Amos to get out of town. Go back to Judah. Go back to where you come from. Earn your living in your own town, the southern kingdom. This is my church, my sanctuary. You ever heard that before? This is our church. Nobody from the outside is going to tell us how to run our church. Some even say, I don't care how they do it other places. As long as I'm here, it's going to be done my way. My church, my people, my, 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 my. Oh, those people are like Amaziah, though. They are a misguided people. Amaziah failed to understand, just like those that say that understand, that, that God's jurisdiction is over the entire universe. It's not held to any one particular place or time. We, can, we, don't, we can't box God in. Amen. God, he, 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 he has jurisdiction over the entire universe. And then in verse 14, 15, this is what Amos tells Amaziah. Oh, and I can identify with this, Reverend Ford. Amos says, I was neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I was a shepherd. And I also took care of the sycamore trees. But the Lord, but the Lord took me from tending the flock. And he said to me to go and prophesy to my people Israel. 
I can identify with that, Dr. Well, see that I was, I was self-employed, Amos said. I didn't need to earn a living in the ministry. I was minding my own business, he said. I was doing the things that I was comfortable doing. I went to church when I felt like it. And when I didn't feel like it, I stayed at home. I didn't have to worry about getting up, preparing a sermon for Sunday morning. I was living in my comfort, comfort zone, and I was comfortable doing that. But the Lord, but the Lord, the Lord took me from tending to my flock and to tending to my business. And he told me to go and tend to his flock and his business. And Amos said, and I answered the Lord. Now I'll tell you what you do, Amaziah. You listen to the word of the Lord. I'm reminded of Ezekiel chapter 33, 7 through 9, and I didn't give you this part. But when God told Ezekiel, he said, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people. So hear the word that I speak to you, son of man. And you give the people the warning that I give to you to give to them. So it is God that appoints the watchman. Not man. It's God that appoints the watchman. God told Ezekiel, I appointed you, Ezekiel. Now what you do, Ezekiel, you hear the words I speak to you. And your job is to speak those words to the people. Whether they hear it or not, that ain't, that ain't none of your business, Ezekiel. Your job is to give them the words I give to you. And if you don't give it to them, and those folks die in their sins, God says, I'm going to hold you responsible for them. If you don't get anything else today, you need to know that God's word is true from Genesis to Revelation. God calls the watchman. God appoints the man of God. God gives that man or woman the message to give to his people, and our job is to receive it. We can't back away from it even when we want to. That's why Amos told Amaziah that God called me, and I answered him. And I'll tell you what you need to do, brother. You need to listen to the word of the God. And he said, you say, don't prophesy against Israel. Stop preaching against the descendants of Isaac. Therefore, this is what the Lord says, that your wife will become a prostitute in the city, and your sons and daughters will fall by the sword. Your land will be measured and divided up, and you yourself, Amaziah, will die in a pagan country. And, and Israel will surely go into exile, away from their native land. God had grown tired of Israel's repeated sins. Amos documented the reason for God's judgment against them. He said it was legal injustice, economic exploitation, religious hypocrisy, luxurious indulgence, and boastful complacency. And God sent them warning. In the book of Amos, God said, look, I sent you famine, but you didn't listen. I sent a drought, you didn't listen. I sent war, you didn't listen. And I think about today, God is warning us every day. He sent us tornadoes, we don't listen. He sent us hurricanes, we don't listen. He sent us COVID-19, we don't listen. God is warning us today. He has the plumb line set in among true blood-washed believers to see how we measure up. We need to listen before we are destroyed. Oh, I, I, I hear God, Jesus, saying today that the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. He said, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send laborers. God wants some fearless servants. He, he, he wants someone who's not afraid to deliver his message. Not my message, but his message. Someone who's willing to to stand on the wall with the plumb line in their hand and declare to blind men and women that the wages of sin is still death, but the gift of God is still eternal life. In John 3, 16, Jesus said, For God so loved the world. He loved sinners like me. He loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And in verse 17, which I think is very important, he said, look, for the Son of Man came not to condemn the world, but that the world may be saved through him. And so he wrapped himself in flesh, came down through 42 generations, armed with grace, armed with mercy. He lived a sinless life, went around doing good, healing the sick, giving sight to the blind. And he ended up on Calvary, where they nailed his hands to the cross, and they nailed his feet to the cross. They crucified my Lord and your Lord, and he died on the cross. They took him down from that cross and buried him in a borrowed tomb. But he didn't need it long, because on the third day, he rose again with all power in his hands. And now he sits at the right hand of the Father. But one day, he's coming back. He's coming back for a church without a spot or a wrinkle. And when he comes back, Dr. Overstreet, I want him to find me standing on the wall, declaring to the world that Jesus is Lord and that his word is true and everlasting. So Pastor Overstreet, stay on the wall, my brother. When they talk about you, stay on the wall. If they mistreat you, stay on the wall. I don't know about you, but one of these days, when this business that we call living is over, I want to hear him say, well done, thy good and faithful, fearless servant. Well done. Amen. The doors of the church are now open. We extend an invitation to discipleship. May we stand. There may be one today who does not know Jesus as their personal Savior. And you want to give yourself to the Lord. Now is the time. Amen. There may be somebody that's watching on YouTube or Facebook today. If you are, there's a number on the screen. You can call it right now. Leave your name, your number. Somebody will get back with you and walk you through the plan of salvation. Amen, amen, and maybe some here today who just want to rededicate your life. You can come right now. Amen, you may be seated. May God bless you and keep you is our sincere prayers. Now we're going to have remarks from our pastor. First of all, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Benjamin, and thank you, Ebenezer Baptist Church. For many, many years, I was sitting here with my wife. I very seldom have time to sit with her because most time I'm in the pulpit. And I was reflecting back over in my young years when I came here my 40s and I thank God for blessing me and blessing you and I thank you for allowing me to sit down today and let Reverend Benjamin take the reins and bring the message so I just can't thank you enough for my wife and my family and I see some of my children over there and my grandchildren and I thank God for them to come and be with their grandpa, amen, and that's what they call me, grandpa, and so I'm so very, very happy today that I'm still alive and I'm still moving and have my being, and I give all thanks and grace to our Heavenly Father once again for allowing me to wake up this morning and be here with you all, and may God continue to bless you and bless me 
which he's doing right now. Amen. Well, once again, thank you and thank you. Back in your hand, Dr. Bingham. Amen. Amen. We thank you. We love you, Pastor. And we appreciate everything that you continue to do for us. And um, so, you know, I, I, I uh, Paul, can you just kind of let folks see the the attendance, the the members Amen. here today? Amen. Come on, give yourself a hand. Amen. Amen. Oh, amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And I, I want those who, uh, who are not here just to see that we are social distancing and we are following the CDC guidelines and we're, we're doing everything we can do to make sure we keep people safe. So, again, thank you all for coming. We love you we, and we love the Lord and we praise him and lift him up. And, again, if you have time, come back to honor Passover Street and um, with your presence and with uh, whatever gift you would like to give this morning. So all mine satisfied now. We will stand and be dismissed. Now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rests and rule with us now and forever. Let us all say, Amen. Amen.